Welcome to the online worship service of Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church. Triumph is a multi-site church in the Midwest with campuses in Moorhead, Minnesota and West Fargo, North Dakota. Our vision is to see the life and message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and cities. We're grateful that you've joined us online as the Lord works through our ministry both locally and around the world. Wherever you are at, our prayer is that God would meet you and that the life and message of Jesus would transform your life. Let's begin with a call to worship from Nehemiah chapter 9. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God, who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. Amen. What a fellowship, what a joy divine Leaning on the everlasting arms What a blessedness, what a peace is mine Leaning on the everlasting arms I'm leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms I'm leaning, leaning Leaning on the everlasting arms Oh, how sweet to all in this pilgrim way Leaning on the everlasting arms Oh, how bright the path Grows from day to day Leaning on the everlasting arms I'm leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alone Yeah. 
The scripture reading for today is from the book of Colossians, verses 1 through 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory.
Have you ever felt like you're in chains? Do you feel like you're in chains right now? Like chained to something difficult or something painful, even something monotonous in your life. Maybe chained to something like arthritis or your money problems or your job or your lack of a job. Or maybe you feel chained to a relationship, one that's maybe toxic or, or broken or, or even empty and hopeless. Or maybe you're just chained to your worries, your fears, your guilts, your regrets, chained to all the woulda, coulda, shouldas in our life. You ever feel like you're in chains? Do you feel like you're in chains right now? Well, for all of us who do, for all of us who know what it's like to feel chained, I think that God's word to us today from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians is really going to pack a punch. At least I, I hope it does, because it did for me. Now, first of all, you should know that the Apostle Paul is writing this letter in chains, like literally. Paul is writing this letter in prison chains for basically for, for being a Christian and for telling people about Jesus Christ. In this letter, Philippians, th th uh, this is the letter that, that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, which was a major city in ancient Macedonia. Fun fact, it was actually the first Christian church in Europe. And another fun fact, the Apostle Paul was the one who planted this church, who, who started this church in Philippi on one of his missionary journeys. And uh, Paul adores these people. This is the warmest and by far the most affectionate of all Paul's New Testament letters. So, so Paul's writing uh, a letter to a church of people that he loves very much. And the feeling's mutual. The people there love Paul too. And, and Paul knows that. And he also knows that by now that they've heard that he's in chains and uh, they're going to be concerned about him. That, uh, they're going to be worried about his health and, and how he's being treated there. And <clears throat> honestly, they're going to be wondering whether Paul's actually uh, even going to be able to survive this. And Paul also knows that because he's in chains that the Philippians are going to be worried about the gospel, the, uh, that the good news of the salvation through uh, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that they're, they're worried that that's going to be derailed. Uh, they'll be worried that Paul's mission to spread the gospel of Jesus will be stopped. So Paul writes them a letter in chains. And uh, over the next few weeks, as a church here at Triumph, we're going to be going through this whole letter to the Philippians. But today is just a snippet of it. As, as sort of an introduction, we're going to just look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Let me read it for us. The Apostle Paul writes, Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me does actually serve to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else then I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. This is God's word. Now, when Paul writes this letter, he's obviously in a pretty awful situation. He, he's in chains. Paul was literally chained to an officer in the Roman Praetorian Guard. Now, uh, 
the Praetorian Guard's main job is basically protecting Caesar, so they're kind of like Rome's secret service, I guess. But anyway, these guys are elite, the, the, the best of the best. And Paul was chained to uh, one of these Roman secret service guys around the clock, 24 uh, seven, no breaks. Now the guards took shifts, yes. So the guards would change, but Paul was always chained to, you know, whoever it was that was on duty. So he had zero privacy I mean, he couldn't have any conversations in privacy. He, he couldn't go to the bathroom in privacy. He, he couldn't sleep in privacy. I mean, this is bad. And if that wasn't uh, awful and dehumanizing enough, being in chains also meant that Paul's missionary career was sort of permanently on hold. That his career, his calling was to plant churches. And now... Now he's literally chained down. He, he can't go anywhere, so he can't do it. He can't plant churches. And to top it all off, maybe worst of all, pretty much at any time Paul could be put on trial and executed. So, so just, just think about that, that you wake up every day of your life wondering if it'll be your last. It, it, it's awful. I mean, Paul's life has gone sideways. He's in chains. But when he writes his letter to the Philippian church, he, he doesn't dwell on any of that. Uh, he, he doesn't have a pity party. He doesn't focus on himself. He doesn't focus on his chains. Instead, Paul's first concern is to reassure them, the, the church, to reassure the church that, that his chains are not stopping the gospel, okay? In fact, he tells them that the opposite, shockingly, the opposite is true. Look again at verse 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, this being in chains, has really served to advance the gospel. Now, now, now here's what he means. In verse 12, he says, I want, I want you to see that, that what's happened to me, being in chains, that, that even though it's really bad, it's actually turning out for good. Why? He says, because the whole Praetorian Guard, the, the whole Secret Service, knows about the gospel. Now, Paul lives to, to spread the gospel and to plant churches, and, and in a million years, he never would have signed up to be stuck preaching to the Praetorian Guard. But think about it. Now he has a captive audience for his evangelism. I mean, sure, he can't get away from them, but they can't get away from him either. So two or three times a day, some hard-nosed, awful, mean-spirited, pagan, praetorian guard changes shifts and gets chained to the most persuasive evangelist that's ever lived in the history of the world. And one by one, they're getting converted. They're coming to know Jesus. And Paul is essentially saying, you know what? I mean, I sure wouldn't have planned this. I sure wouldn't have asked for these chains. I don't want to be in chains. But God is turning this bad situation into good. People are still coming to faith here. So some good is coming out of this terrible situation. What's bad, his chains, has provided an opportunity for what's good, the gospel being heard by people that Paul uh, would never normally reach. Paul's chains have created an opportunity for the gospel to expand, the, the reach of the gospel to expand. But, and, and this is really important, so, so please don't miss this. Paul doesn't say that bad is good, okay? That, uh, that's not what he's saying. I mean, God can use what is bad and bring good from it, but bad is always bad, and we should never pretend otherwise. I mean, Paul, Paul never says that any of the wrong done to him was right. He, he never claims that his chains are anything but bad, but instead, he says that God took what was something that was clearly bad and brought something good out of it. And, I mean, that, that's intense. And, and, and if you think that's intense, just wait, because Paul doesn't stop there. He, he doubles down on this and actually escalates this idea. Because if you look down at verse 19, 
if you have your Bibles with you there. Uh, Paul says this, he says, I know that through your prayers and the help of the spirit of Jesus Christ that what has happened to me, these chains will turn out for my deliverance. Now, honestly, uh, the word deliverance here in our NIV Bibles, that, that's, that's not a great translation of this word. So, so let me tell you what it, what it literally says. The way that, that Paul wrote this in the original language says this. It says, what has happened to me, again, these chains will turn out for my salvation. Okay, deliverance isn't the best translation here of this word. It should be translated salvation because everywhere else in the New Testament where this word is used, it's translated salvation. And so now you're saying, well, so what? I mean, well, the reason that it matters is because that, that when you read it like the, the NIV Bible has it, it, it looks like Paul's saying that I know that through your prayers and through the power of Jesus that the Spirit of Jesus will deliver me from these chains. I'm going to get out of these chains. I'm not going to be executed. I'll be out of here soon. Don't worry about it. See, when you translate that word as deliverance, it looks like that's what Paul's saying. But it's not. That's not it. That, that's not what Paul's saying. Because literally what, what, what the original language says, what the grammar says, Paul's actually saying, I know that through your prayers and, and through the spirit of Jesus, that what has happened to me, that these chains will turn out for my salvation. So he's not saying, I'll be saved in spite of these chains. Instead, he's saying, I'll be saved because of these chains. I'll be saved because of these chains. Now, now if you didn't say, whoa, right now, if the hair didn't stand up straight up on the back of your neck right now, you're not paying attention here. Because Paul just straight up said that these awful chains are going to turn out to save him. And if, if you don't believe it, just look ahead to verse 20, where Paul says, whether I live or die. You see, uh, at the end of verse 20, he says, I, I might get out of these chains and live, or I might not get out of these chains and die. It ultimately doesn't matter because I know that these chains at this terrible time in my life will turn out to save me. Now listen, what, what Paul's talking about here, I, I mean, th this is advanced, okay? Th th this is, if there is such a thing, this is advanced Christianity here. I, I, I don't know what else to call it. This is groundbreaking stuff here because Paul's basically saying, look, I'm chained to the Praetorian Guard here, but I'm rejoicing because I know that these chains are saving me. They're making me more into the man I want to be. They're, they're refining me. They're maturing me. They're making me more uh, like the person that God wants me to be. They're making me more tender, more loving, more humble, more courageous. These chains are making me more like Jesus. And it, I mean, this isn't just Paul saying that, that God can bring something good out of these terrible chains. No, Paul is saying that God is using these terrible chains to bring something good out of him. Paul is essentially saying, look, I need this. This is good for me. This is advanced, advanced Christianity here. And the reason that I keep saying this is because you know, this just isn't the kind of thing that, that you say, oh, okay, now I get it. So that's how I could deal with feeling like I, I, I'm in chains in my life. Cool, I'm going to totally start working on this next Monday morning, first thing. It's not that kind of thing. It's not an easy thing. This is advanced. This is what a great man... This is a man who is facing the worst of the worst. A man who, I mean, listen, if you want to see what greatness looks like, here it is. This is it. You're looking at greatness here. When the Apostle Paul's life goes sideways, when, when he's literally in chains, He's not falling apart. He's not whining about it. He's not crushed. He's not devastated. 
Now, that doesn't mean that he doesn't weep. It doesn't mean that he's not grieved. It doesn't mean that he doesn't pray about it. It doesn't mean that he doesn't struggle with this. But this is ultimately what he does with it. This is ultimately where he takes it. He says, God is using these chains to bring some good out of me. I might not see it, but I know it. I need this. This will mature me. This will make me more like Jesus. And now I get it. I mean, seriously, I get that, uh, that this is a, a pretty big idea to try to wrap our minds around, that the, the things that we feel chained to in our life are working for our good to mature us, to make us more like Jesus. So in order to, to help with that, in order to help us maybe wrap our minds a little bit better around this, let, let me give you the best example of this that I can think of, the best illustration that I can think of. And this illustration comes to us from, from really one of the truly great spiritual masterpieces of our time, the Karate Kid. Now, The Karate Kid is a movie about the skinny kid named Daniel LaRusso, who moves with his mom from New Jersey to L.A. And right away, Daniel sort of hits it off with this girl at school, this girl that he just met named Allie Mills. But Allie's ex-boyfriend named Johnny Lawrence wants to get back together with Allie. So, so he gets all ticked off when she starts hanging out with Daniel. And so, so then Johnny and his Cobra Kai karate buddies start bullying Daniel, and they end up beating him up pretty good. So Daniel wants to learn karate so he can defend himself and you know, maybe even give old Johnny Lawrence a little bit of payback. So When he finds out that the maintenance guy at his apartment building knows karate, Mr. Miyagi, Daniel asks Mr. Miyagi if he'll teach him karate. Now, at at first, Mr. Miyagi doesn't want to, but he changes his mind once he sees how desperate Daniel is. So he tells Daniel to come to his house early the next morning and he'll start teaching him karate. So Daniel does. He he goes to Mr. Miyagi's house before the sun comes up. And I mean, he's ready to go. He's ready to learn karate. He's ready to train. He's he's ready to fight. So Mr. Miyagi takes Daniel outside to this row of dusty and dirty classic cars. And then Mr. Miyagi says, to learn karate, you must do everything I say. First, wash cars. Then wax on wax off. With right hand, wax on. With left hand, wax off. And then he leaves Daniel to wash and wax all the cars. So that's how Daniel spends his first day of karate training, chained, if you will, to a bunch of old cars. Wax on, wax off, all day long. And once he's finished, then Mr. Miyagi tells him to come back again, bright and early the next morning to, uh, to, to learn karate. So Daniel shows up again, and, and you know, maybe uh, the second day he's not quite as gung-ho as he was the first day, because having been chained to washing and waxing all those cars, but he's still desperate to learn karate. But once again, Mr. Miyagi chains Daniel to more long, boring, monotonous work. And that's their routine. Every morning, Daniel shows up at the crack of dawn to learn karate. And every morning, Mr. Miyagi chains him to some kind of long, boring, monotonous work. First, it was waxing the cars. Then it was sanding Mr. Miyagi's floor. Then it was painting Mr. Miyagi's house and and then painting his enormous fence both sides. And, and if that wasn't bad enough, Mr. Miyagi's just so stinking picky about, uh, ab- about this. I mean, D- Daniel's not only chained to the jobs, but he's also chained, Mr. Miyagi also chains him to the ridiculously precise technique that he has to use to do the job. Wax on, wax off in broad circular motions and sand the floor in tight scrubbing circles. Paint the house in 
precise side to side strokes and paint the fence in a brisk up and down motion. And by this time, by the time he gets through, uh, you know, all these jobs, seriously, I mean, Daniel's over it. He, he's had it with being chained to this meaningless work. He's sweaty and blistered and worn out. Uh, and honestly, ready, he's ready to blow a gasket. And so he confronts Mr. Miyagi. He, he gets right in his face and he says, you told me you'd teach me karate, but, but all you've done is make me your slave. The only thing I learned is how to wash your stupid cars and sand your floors and, and paint your house and your fence. And Mr. Miyagi says, not everything is as seems. And Daniel says, forget it. I'm going home. And walks away. And Mr. Miyagi says, daniel son." Daniel ignores him, just keeps on walking. And then Mr. Miyagi says, daniel son." There's steel in his voice. Come here. So Daniel turns around and comes back to face him. And Mr. Miyagi says, show me sand the floor. So Daniel shows him the motions. And then Mr. Miyagi says, show me wax on, wax off. And Daniel does it. Show me paint the fence. And Daniel moves his arms up and down. Now, Show me paint house. And Daniel's arms swing from side to side. And then Mr. Miyagi just stands there, staring Daniel straight in the eye. And then out of nowhere, Mr. Miyagi attacks Daniel, kicking and punching in, in a flurry of fists and feet. And, and out of nowhere, out of the clear blue, Daniel blocks every single punch and kick. That in the midst of being chained to all of that washing and waxing and sanding and painting, it turns out that Daniel learned and uh, developed the muscle memory for karate's eight-point blocking system. These long, boring, exhausting jobs that Daniel had been chained to for days taught him karate. He didn't even know it. And look, I, I, I know that sometimes we all wonder if our lives really have any, any real meaning or significance. I mean, we feel like our lives are just so lame and boring and monotonous. And, and, and sometimes we might wonder why God seems so stinking picky about certain things. Do we have to do things exactly like this or just like that? Or we, we can't do this this way, you know, instead of how we think we should do it or how we want to do it. But listen, this is when the Lord wants us to remember that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Now, Paul says this. These are Paul's words. Just a few verses earlier in <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So this, this means then that God is using the things that you feel chained to to accomplish his good saving work in you. God is using your chains to do good work in you. God is using all the, the difficult and painful and monotonous things that you're feeling chained to. God is using your arthritis and your money problems and your dead-end job and, and your lack of a job. God is also using that toxic or broken or hopeless relationship that you're chained to. And God is definitely using your worries, your guilts, your regrets. God is using all the woulda, coulda, shouldas that you're chained to. That's the idea that Paul is giving us here today. No, that's the gift that God is giving us today through his faithful servant Paul. The gift of knowing that God uses our chains to bring some good out of us that we need this, that this will mature us, that ultimately this will make us more like Jesus. 
whether we know it or not. This is the gift of knowing that God, who began a good work in you, will, absolutely will, carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Which means then that one day, the day of Christ Jesus, you will truly and fully be the person that God has always meant for you to be. One day, you will be like Jesus. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we confess that we have a lot of expectations for our life. And we also confess that sometimes that we feel so chained down by things in our life. And we get emotional about this when, you know, when we feel like we're going to miss out on something in life because of some hard or bad thing that, that we feel chained to. And so, Father, we confess that, that our expectations can sometimes rule our hearts. And so we pray, Father, that, that you would, again, forgive us. And so we pray, Father, that in and through and because of Jesus, that you would forgive us. And we, we also pray that you would please help us to, to give our desires and our expectations to you and help us to, to want Jesus more than we want anything else or anyone else. And help us to, to cling to your promise to, to make our chains turn out for good. Uh, help us to believe that the good work that you've started in us, you will be faithful to complete at the day of Christ Jesus. And, and maybe uh, above all, remind us over and over again that we've been given the greatest gift of all in Jesus. Remind us that he is enough. And we pray that you would also remind us of the hope that we have in him, especially when our chains feel the heaviest. For we do pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's respond to the word of the Lord in worship. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you, oh, we live for you, and holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me upon your love 
vision I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation Beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your love and lead me in your love to those around me. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a Our final word from the Lord for today comes to us from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Amen. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace, both now and forever. Amen. Thanks for joining us today for our worship service. If you are being impacted by our services, would you take this time to share this video on social media? Sharing, or, if, or even with a friend. Sharing is a great way to help new people get acquainted with Triumph and hear the grace and truth in Jesus Christ. We would love to see you next week online or in person as we continue our journey through the book of Philippians.